everybody. It's Kathy Close Guest from Keeping It Human with another Hangout where we get to talk to people who are doing very cool stuff in the marketing arena. And today we have a great guest, a guest that I met several years ago at Funny Business, the Funny Business Conference in San Francisco, where he talked about one of my favorite topics, and that was humor in, in marketing. And I'm so excited to welcome Peter McGraw. He is an Associate Professor of Marketing and Psychology at the University of Colorado at Boulder. And he's the co-author of The Humor Code. And I also love that he directs the Humor Lab at the university uh, with the acronym HURL. So <laughs> That's right. yes. With that, welcome to the, uh, to the Hangout, Peter. Oh, thanks for having me, Kathy. It's good to see you again. It's great to see you. Uh, I think I might have mentioned this to you, that recently I was even talking to an audience in Japan, actually, about humor. Mm -hmm. And they were asking me about theories of humor and I, I, I was so glad that you know we talked and I had seen your research because I was like, in fact, yes, there's this guy named Peter McGraw and he wrote this book called The Humor Code and, and I talked about the benign violations theory and it was great to be able to have a concept to get your arms around to help people frame it. So with that, Peter, quickly, can you explain the benign violations theory to people? Sure, yeah, I'd be happy to. Uh, so this is uh, this idea of, of humor arising from things well, let me stop. Let me say this, is that one of the things that you see whenever you study humor is this sort of perplexing uh, contrast, this delightful, enjoyable experience seemingly arises from kind of negative, threatening, yeah. you know, difficult kinds of circumstances. So all the previous um, theories of humor in some ways touch on this idea. So. Mm -hmm. So Mark Twain said that the secret source of humor is not joy, but sorrow. There is no humor in heaven, <laughs> which, you know, is like really upsetting to some people. Um, but the point is, is that because, because heaven is this perfect place, because there's nothing wrong there, there's nothing to laugh about. Yeah. But the things that usually are, that are wrong usually make us cry or they, they anger us or they frustrate us or they make us sad. Um, they don't make us laugh. There has to be something else there. And, mm -hmm. and what we find in our, in our studies in Hurl is that, that it's a situation that is wrong yet okay, or a situation that's threatening yet safe, or one that is confusing yet makes sense. And this is what creates that delight, is the recognition that the situation is actually not bad. And then you laugh to signal to others that, this violation is benign, as we like to say. Right, right. It's sort of the, uh, uh, you know, it's the somebody fell down the stairs, but they didn't get hurt. I'm okay. And everyone's like, Woo, okay, funny. <laughs> I, I can laugh about it. Yeah, I mean, actually, you know, so the, the, the television show America's Funniest Home Videos yeah. Yeah. is really good about creating these situations. So, you know, mo the average America's Funniest Home Video, um, the really, really funny ones is someone potentially getting really hurt. But what they do in that show to help make that situation benign is they, they accompany it with this sort of upbeat, fun, campy music. Yeah. And they have a live audience that's laughing. Right. If you ever turn on that show or if you ever go watch a video and you turn the volume off, it's actually oftentimes very difficult to find those situations funny because it's hard to see how they're okay. Well, that's a really good point. Although, in so, gosh, context does matter, and you make a really great point. Although, I, with some of those videos, I do see where it's just completely, it looks staged and contrived because mm -hmm. it's like, oh boy, the tree's about ready to fall, and the car's parked conveniently right, at, right near the tree. Oh, oops, it's going to hit it. And it, it's one of those things where, and I think you talk about this in your book that sometimes we expect stuff to happen. It's not that it's unexpected and we'd be disappointed. Like if there was a banana peel in a scene and nobody stepped on the banana peel and slipped, we'd be like, oh, but it was put there for somebody to, be, you know, to step on. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, you know, so our expectations in many ways uh, helps determine what's wrong and what's not wrong in the world. Yeah. And, uh, and, and in part because... Uh, because we all have different values and different um, cultural beliefs and different um, life experiences, what ends up becoming funny to one person is actually really offensive to another person and is boring to, to another. 
and um, certainly, role, you know, expectations may have a have a role in that. And one of the things that I like about the theory, if I may, as my own theory, <laughs> is uh, is that it can help accommodate each of how this very same thing, the same joke or the same image um, or the same behavior can make one person cry, another person laugh, and another person yawn, right? It's, it's purely a violation in one situation. There's nothing okay. It's a benign violation in the case of laughter. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong. It's purely benign in the case of the yawn, yeah. which, which helps demonstrate how difficult it is even for a show like America's Funniest Home Videos, which has been on for, I don't know how long. I don't know, is it still on even? Yeah, um, it is, it actually is. Is it, okay. Um, how it can have such a, uh, such a long run, but yet there are plenty of people who go, oh, I can't watch that show, it just makes me cringe too much, you know? Yeah, well, and that's true, that, and that's a really good point. One of the things that I found really interesting about your research is, because, um, you know, as, a, as somebody who's a storyteller and also a, an improviser and a stand-up comic, I, you know, I, I'm much more of the school of just practicing it. We don't spend a lot of time dissecting the frog. Uh, it's, it's sometimes it's not funny if we over dissect it. But I, what I really appreciate about your theory is that, and it tends to be expansive enough not only to work across different scenarios but cultures too, because it also seems to be the first theory that I've read about that actually takes into account all these different variables, and it's very difficult for a theory to do that. Yeah, well, thank you. I, you know, I mean, of course, the strength of the theory is also its weakness. Yeah. In the sense that it, um, if you want to write a better joke, it's not obvious how the, the theory tells you to do it. I mean, it, it only gives very blunt kind of um, lessons, right? So, so for instance, like I think, uh, you know, you can you can make a living. You can be an, a, a very funny comedian, and not and not know what makes things funny. Actually, in the humor code, my co-author Joel Warner and I had a really awkward interaction with Louis <laughs> today. Yeah. And, and Louis just didn't believe the theory. Um, and, and so we had this, it, it actually became a sort of borderline inappropriate conversation that we <laughs> ended up having with him. But, he, you know, he, he's a very funny man and he has very good instincts. Yeah. And he tests his material. So, so right. he just takes an, an empirical approach to it. Now, if you wanted to use the theory, if you wanted to use this idea, you'd say, okay, well, I need to create a situation that's wrong, yet okay. Well, that can, that can help explain a little bit like, okay, well, what are you talking about? Are you talking about something that, that normally seems okay? If that's the case, then find what's wrong with that situation. So, so um, I call that the Seinfeld strategy. Mm. Right, so Jerry Seinfeld does this observational form of comedy, which he, he basically had a show about nothing. He had a show about everyday regular life. But what they did was highlight all the weird things that occur as humans when we come into contact. The other way to think about it is, was well, is this topic something that's really not okay? You know, so am I talking about cancer? Am I talking about, you know, like something really, really bad in the world? Um, you know, Tig Notaro has this famous comedy set in which she she talked about being diagnosed with with cancer. Well, in that situation, you have to find a way to make it okay. Um, so I call that the Silverman strategy. <laughs> After Sarah Silverman, who you know, every time she gets on stage, she she basically commits a hate crime. <laughs> but how is it that she does this? Like, how is it she gets away with saying these things? And, you know, oftentimes she sort of, you know, she puts it to upbeat music or she uses this sort of almost like childlike voice yeah. that helps. It just, you don't have the same association with it. It's not like when a 40 year old person says it, it feels like a child saying it and there's some innocence associated with it. Mm -hmm. And so, so those are very blunt um, suggestions, uh, you know, so again, as I said, the, the strength of the theory is also ends up becoming its, its weakness in some ways. Well, and it, is hard. it is hard because I, when you, I, I remember you telling this story um, when you were speaking and you talked about Louis C.K. going, ah. Eh. Yeah. And I, and I can see how that happens as a practitioner. You, um, you don't dissect it. You're not, you're looking, it's such a visceral thing. He, he, he is so in his gut. And you develop a gut about it that you're not you're not intellectualizing about it. So I can see where, on some 
you know, level, if, if we were to break it down, it, it's probably, it happens at such a subconscious level for him. He's such an expert. Um, so I can see where, you know, com cause comics don't think about it in that way. But for people who don't have that background, mm -hmm. it is a great way for them to go, well, then how do I shake up expectations mm -hmm. in such a way to not piss people off right. and to be funny. And I think for, for people like that, I think, I think that theory can be really, really helpful. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that it can help. Uh, I, get, I think it can help cut the learning curve is the way I, I tend generally think about it, right? It's not going to turn the average person into the next great stand-up or the next great comedy writer. Right. But if you are, if you have that orientation where you're trying to, to seek out new information or new, you know, a new way to, to, to approach a situation, you have a hunch it could provide a, a bit more focus on one area or another mm -hmm. um, that you would have, right? So, because I think like, you know, if you if you look, I mean, you know, I've got a whole bunch of books back here, like, you know, the comedy toolbox and how to, how to write comedy and all these kinds of things. And what's interesting is they're very good about saying, well, you need to write every day and you need to write a hundred jokes for every one you test on stage and for every 100 you test on stage, you'll keep 10 of them. and like the, the kind of mechanics of becoming a funny person, especially a professionally funny person, yeah. is very little in there about, um, about what, what actually makes things funny. I like the idea that you can, you can help people hone their instincts in that way. Yeah, I do too, I do too. I'm, I'm curious, and, and since you published the book, has there been anything that has made you um, that you would add to the theory or anything, uh, any other examples where you, you, you can give um, that show a little bit richer side to it? Well, um, let's see. So I think, yeah, well, I guess the issue is this is the, really the book is, uh, you, you know, so the, the subtitle of the book is a global, a global search for what makes things funny. So, so the book's written kind of as part memoir, part travelogue, part pop science book. And, uh, and so, for instance, we go to Japan to try to understand Japanese comedy. You know, when we told people we were doing this book, they were like, you need to explain Japanese game shows to me because I just don't get them. Um, and so the book really was very focused on the what. And I, what I think this, the, the next stage is the how is what actually what we've been talking about mm. is that if you wanted to if you wanted to take someone from being this funny to that fun that level that level of funny what would be the best way to do it would it be to to enroll them into improv classes and stand up comedy classes or is there some other sort of scientific way where you could actually could give them you know, the kind of state of the art in the same way that there's books being written about happiness and about curiosity and gratitude and so on, where there's actually things that people could actually try in their day-to-day -day life. Mm -hmm. It's theory-based, and it's evidence-based to, to actually be either, either laugh more easily or to better produce laughter in others. And so that's what we're, we've turned our attention to in Hurl in mm. terms of thinking about what kind of research can we do to not, I believe we can answer the question, what? We yeah. have a good enough answer. But, but the how, how do you make people funnier? So there's almost no research on that. Yeah. And That's then there's this one world on my bookshelf <laughs> that does a pretty good job. But my question is, is could science do a better job? Or could science plus my bookshelf together do an even better job? That's a really interesting theory. Um, you know, because of somebody who's done improv and, and stand-up comedy, mm -hmm. I will tell you that the one thing that in, in improv they try to cure you of is trying to be funny. Uh, yeah. they, they actually tell you, don't be funny because when you're trying too hard, you ruin the scene. And unlike stand-up comedy where you're out there with a microphone, your job is to be funny. Yes. In improv, it's actually the opposite, is in that the humor will come out of these mundane slice of life scenarios, which is really weird because as somebody who started out in stand-up, when I went to improv, it flipped my brain. They were they said, 
the funniest you will ever be is when you're not trying to be funny. And yeah. it was like, what? <laughs> so it, it sort of flipped the model for me, but actually it was true. So if there's a way that you could find that these different approaches plus some science method that would say, here's the learning curve and here's the things you could do. Right. That, that would be actually very impressive. Yeah. So like, so for instance, <laughs> let's, let's say, let's say you're a manager. Yeah. Right. So, you, so you're a manager and you, um, you know, you, you have a weekly staff meeting. Mm -hmm. so, um, or you're a salesperson and you're out on the showroom floor or you're interacting in a B2B situation. You're making calls to your, your regular customers and you're trying to get to get new ones. You know, every one of those interactions, there's an opportunity for some levity. Mm -hmm. Right. There's an and and what we what we know is on balance. Um, having some levity is better than none. You know what I mean? Like so. Yeah. So, you know, employees they want to enjoy the, their their interactions at work. They want to have some fun. Uh, a um, a customer is going to to like and trust and enjoy uh, their interactions with a salesperson when that salesperson's funnier than when they're not. Now, mm -hmm. I'm not suggesting that that these folks act like clowns and they're always joking and never taking their work seriously, but there's plenty of room for play within a workplace. And then the question becomes, okay, well, uh, let's suppose we can't select on that, right? We have an existing group of people who are working for us. There's a certain number of those people who are skilled in this area and, and would benefit from, from turning it on a little bit more. Yeah. And then the question becomes, do they turn it on, like an improviser where they just lighten the mood a little bit and they become more playful Yes. or do they turn it on like a stand-up comic does, which is to purposely pick out moments in time with, let's say a go-to joke. Mm -hmm. So a salesperson, you can imagine easily doing that, right? So, so they have, they have 10 calls that morning and the conversation could easily set up the same joke in eight out of 10 of those calls. Mm -hmm. and, um, and to the degree that this person is good at theater, the receiver of that joke is going to enjoy themselves. The improvi improviser um, approach might have eight different jokes of varying degrees of success in that, in that kind of way. And I mean, of course, I think the answer is it's, some, it's something in between where you know as a professor i know i have go-to jokes that i'm going to use in a class and then there's also moments where someone says the right thing and i and you know they've just served up this this uh fastball and i can knock it out of the park you know yeah um i couldn't have planned for that but here it comes and yeah. so i think like for that so you could you could imagine teaching someone the ins and outs of humor the the, the risk of going too far the um some of the ways that you take something that might be wrong and make it okay um and then even some strategies about what is the right way uh what's the right approach to this so if i may i you could think about a kind of dating style approach to humor <laughs> so if you think about it if you go like so you're out on a date with someone right um there's a tendency to want to impress that person. And, and one of the best ways to impress that person is to just reach into your bag of jokes and just and tell the jokes that, that you know are going to be funny. In the same way that a, that a stand-up comedian tells the jokes when he or she is filming a special, they know that every single one of those jokes is gonna be a good joke. Um, and that's great. I think that's actually a problem in, in the case of dating. And the reason is this, is that what humor does is, is that if you're laughing and I'm laughing, it says that we see the world in the same way. We're bonded in a sense. Yeah. And so, and because you don't want a second date just for the sake of a second date, you want a second date because you want to spend more time with this person because you have a connection with him or her. Mm -hmm. What that suggests, and this is a bit counterintuitive, is that you should tell the jokes that you think are funny. And if your date doesn't think they're funny and doesn't want to go out on a second date with you, you both win out. 
in that situation. It's true. Right? It's true, right? Because you need you want both people to be in it. If the yeah. if your date laughs at all your jokes and's like, "Oh, I want to see this person again." That's great. So, so now of course, should you take this dating metaphor and apply it to yeah. business? That's tough. That's a tougher call, right? So, for instance, in a sales context, probably not. And that is yeah. You know, if you're if you're if you have a customer and you're going to, you know, just tell the jokes you think are funny, you risk alienating this customer. Right. But suppose you're suppose you're a B2B customer and you're trying to figure out am, do I want a long-standing relationship with this salesperson? Well, maybe you know, depending on how much variance there are in the in the products or services that are being sold, to the degree that you're buying a relationship, maybe you take the dating approach, where you tell some jokes that might be a little, uh, you know, I don't know. And if the person laughs and they're fun with it and all that stuff, you're like, oh, I'm going to enjoy getting a weekly phone call from this person. Mm -hmm. You know, and so you can think, you can start to think about it in these sort of somewhat kind of strategic ways um, about like, how much should you just shoot from the hip and how much of it you should temper your uh, your sense of humor a little bit. That's really interesting because your your sort of game theory meets meets your <laughs> yeah. theory. A little bit, yeah. It depends on the nature of the relationship. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah. And, it, and if it's a repeat interaction, and I'm thinking like, you know, if, if Nash Equilibrium were funny, you used to humor, <laughs> what would that look like, right? But I think it's actually a really interesting problem you just described because it's exactly that marketing perceives risk mm -hmm. so they're afraid that they will alienate people with humor so then yes. do they try the canned jokes at that point right or are we you know do we want further down the road a a dating relationship because i want to attract the clients that are going to be mutually beneficial and they're going to like my products and it's a good relationship and yeah. that's a very interesting conundrum. So I will be looking forward to seeing what you do with that. <laughs> well, yeah. So I mean, so I, you know, like the very kind of standard marketing approach yeah. is seg segmentation, targeting, and positioning, right? Yeah. So, so who who am I trying to sell to? Yeah. And how am I creating an association in their mind about how I'm different than other people? Yeah. So, uh, so I'm actually teaching this stuff right now in my MBA course. And, uh, and so tomorrow in class, I'm going to show this video from the Old Spice um, ad campaign. It's a very yeah. recent one. And it's a, it's a peculiar video. It has a, um, and I'll apologize to your viewers now um, <laughs> as I describe this, but it has a, it's a video of this very attractive woman and a talking horse. And the horse, so the, and, and, and the horse is basically talking to the camera. It's breaking the fourth wall. And what's fascinating about this, this commercial is that, that if you're not, so it's a very edgy commercial, but it's only an edgy commercial if you're an edgy person, mm -hmm. which is what Old Spice is looking for in their target demographic. They're looking for guys who have some swagger, you know, right. that's the kind of thing. And in the commercial, the horse talks about how he met the young woman at this theater show in Tijuana. Yeah, so you yeah. know you know what that means. You know what that means. Yeah, I do. <laughs> and a lot of the target market knows what that means. But a lot of the non-target market doesn't understand that reference. Mm. And so this is a situation where the humor actually does this this job of creating this very in-group mm. kind of thing. Because if you get the joke, um, chances are you're gonna like the brand more. Right. Some people will get the joke and think it's awful joke. Yeah. Think it's totally inappropriate and awful joke. That person is probably not a good customer for Old Spice anyways. Right. Right? And so you're seeing that's a very risky thing to do. There's all this innuendo. There's plausible deniability. There's all these kinds of things. But what it's doing is it's strengthening the brand's position in the mind of its target market. It may be hurting it in the mind of its non-target market, but who cares about your non-target market? Right. Right. You know, if you try to make everyone happy, you make no one happy. Right. You know, so, so it's like, it's like serving warm tea. So true. And, and you're probably some people to your point 
aren't going to be offended because they will not get the joke. Most most of the people who would be offended won't get the joke. Won't get the joke. Yes. Uh, yeah. So that's a really interesting, and that is a really interesting use of humor because I think the more risky you are with it, you are winking to your audience. But what you're saying is, we know who you are. Yes. You're, you're the per, you're the group we create products for. Yes. And we don't want to lose you. So it almost seems riskier for for Old Spice to abandon that and try to appeal to everybody because they've done such a good job appealing to this millennial male um, market. And I think to build that and then try to abandon it would just be, I think, wouldn't make sense. Yeah, no, I mean, and when also the other you thing know. is it's so hard to stand out yeah. in the marketplace. It's so hard to cut through the clutter. Yeah. And, and humor is a great way to cut through the clutter. Um, and, uh, and unfortunately, though, is that it, it, because, it's, because it's connected to ad liking and because it's attention getting and memorable, a lot of, a lot of uh, brands use it a lot. But what they don't do is they don't use it in a real strategic kind of way. Yeah. They don't use it in a way that is going to work best with their, with their target market, that they're going to use it in a way that's going to help further their brand. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, it just highlights the, the difficulty and also the risk, right? Because yeah. they want to do it, but they, they don't want to, they don't want to go too far, you know? And mm -hmm. so, so it, it ends up becoming a useful strategy, but it's a really difficult one to do very well. That's really, no, it's absolutely fascinating to me. Has there been an example that you've seen lately where it has not worked well? Like they've gone that route? No. Oh yeah. So wasn't there, was a, was it Mountain Dew? Mountain oh. Dew had this goat thing or sh was it a goat? So it had this, so this, I, I remember seeing this and this was, I think it was online advertising, right? So one of the things about online advertising is that it often pushes, it pushes things a lot further because because um, you're not worried about the FCC, right? You're not worried yeah. about decency, you know, regulations and so on. But I think uh, I think I think it was Mountain Dew got in trouble for this thing. Like they just felt like it was it had the wrong kind of racial overtones and and so on in some of their and some of their ads. You know, every year, you know, every year you can kind of like pick something up. You know, a bunch of years ago it was Groupon did this kind of insensitive. Um, Ad. It was supposed to be an ironic ad uh, about the Tibetan, um, about Tibet and the challenges the Tibetans were having and so on. And it was, you know, that, that one happened. That was a big, that was a big problem for Coupon. And that happened just in basically because they didn't test it. Mm. You know, it's really surprising how, you know, if you, you can't let a group of creative people whose, whose threshold is, is very high for offense being offended create something without testing it on, on a group of people whose threshold might be quite lower, yeah. you know? And so, um, so in that way they failed because they didn't take your approach, which is to test the jokes. Um, a simple, you know, a simple focus group or a, or a panel of people watching this would have told you immediately mm -hmm. that they needed to change that message. Right. Yeah. right. And that's interesting because again, it really depends on, what relationship you're trying to build and with what segments. Yeah. And well, yeah, but you know, the problem with, with the Groupon uh, commercial was on, it was on during the Super Bowl. That's true. And so, uh, you know, when you have, when you're, when you're doing an ad for the Super Bowl, you're going to at least be exposing yourself to a, a wide variety of ages, yeah. and races, and even internationally, you know, so in that way, usually what you're doing, that's why I actually, you find so many Super Bowl ads being physical in nature mm -hmm. because the physical comedy is kind of the most universal in that way. Yeah. You know, for as a benign violation, slapstick, tickling, play fighting, these are universals. Little kids um, can experience it. Adults can experience it. Even, yeah. even um, animals. So there's, you know, there's this famous paper about, about laughing rats. You know, these, these researchers have, they basically tickle and roughhouse these rats. <laughs> and it doesn't sound, doesn't seem like there's anything going on, but if you put this uh, ultrasonic um, sound detector 
you hear these rats making this kind of chirping sound. Oh my gosh! And it's a, it's akin to laughter. It's a signal that this uh, that this is fun for them. And they'll even go so far as they'll they'll kind of roughhouse with these rats, and the rats will be making this sound. And then the the scientist will move his hand to the other side of the cage, and the rats will chase the hand and seek out the stimulus, mm -hmm. which um, which is really fascinating because. It's a, that's a lot like turning on the TV and then picking a, a comedy to watch on Netflix on a Friday night, right? You're seeking out this yeah. titillating, somewhat challenging, but positively arousing situation. That's really, that's really cool. I mean, they, it, it, anytime you get to use rats and like tickle them, I mean, that's... <laughs> If we extrapolate some of the stuff we're talking about, because these are really practical applications. We talk about advertising and, and really testing, and I don't know why it, um, advertisers wouldn't test something. I, I know. It, you know, it just seems like common sense. You would you would test it. Um, but if you think about sort of the content of the ads, um, is there anything that you kind of um, – any advice you'd give based on your research of if people are listening to this and going, well, okay, how do I apply, apply that to the content? Before I test it, just content creation, how might yeah. I think about creating that benign violation? Where would you tell people to start? Well, yeah, so I mean, what I would do is actually reiterate this point about how risky it is. And, and, the re and so some of the research that we've been doing lately looks at because you need a violation, because you need something wrong, um, what happens uh, sometimes is that you create a mixed emotional experience. Mm -hmm. So think about America's Funniest Home Videos. So on one hand, you're laughing, but you're also kind of cringy. And, um, and one of the things that we find in the behavioral sciences time and time again is this, this idea that negatives weigh more positive, excuse me, negatives weigh more heavily than positives. It's called the negativity bias or negativity dominance. And so what you have to be careful about is, yeah, you have people laughing, they're also cringing, and the cringing part may have a bigger effect on their attitudes towards your brand than the laughing part of it all. Yeah. And so, um, so, for instance, we find, for instance, that like mild violations within, a, within an ad are much less risky than, than, than big violations. They don't get as big laughs, but they also are less, they're less, um, they're less likely to go off the rails, so to speak, in this kind of way. But it also suggests, like, who's your target? Are you punching up? Are you punching down? So not all laughs are created equal. So, right. so who's the victim in your in your ad? Is it is it your um, is it your competitors? Right. So that's that's what happened in these Mac versus PC ads. Mm -hmm. So these famous ads, right, had this kind of nerdy um, yeah. PC character and then you had this kind of hip you know good looking mac character and those were very funny ads and it was basically apple making fun of of microsoft and uh, and that worked very nicely right you know except what microsoft did in response to that was really brilliant they flipped it around on them they started a big campaign where they had regular everyday people normal looking people doing everyday kinds of things, looking at the camera and saying, I'm a PC, I'm a PC, I'm a PC. And then reminding you that you're a PC and that Mac is just now making fun of you and being this really snarky, <laughs> right, entity. Yeah. And so it went from being this very successful, great campaign, you know, got lots and lots of attention, um, punched down, so to speak, or should be punched up, so to speak. And then all of a sudden it got switched. So now it was punching down. Yeah. I was punching down at you, the customer in that one. Yeah. You just described an improv, what we would call a status shift. Yeah. And that, yes, right. that, that's a very much a, 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 a way to sort of, you know, that that power asymmetry can be played with and, and how that works. And it's funny, at, anecdotally, I remember hearing uh, Justin Long talk about when he got the uh, cast for that commercial, um, he was the one who played the Mac. Okay. He, he thought, I got a callback. I'm clearly, clearly going to be the nerdy guy, the PC. And then, they, <laughs> and then when they said, no, no, you're the Mac, he was like, well, then how nerdy. How nerdy is this other guy? guy. And, and then he met John Hodgman. And that's what, 
I just love that story. It's just a great. Yeah, it's well cast. Yeah, yeah it's very well cast. Really well cast. Um, can you give an example, um, briefly, Peter, of because we're talking about, and I and I hear what you're saying. There's there's big violations and then there's small ones. Yeah. What's an example of a of a small violation where you think the risk is lower because what's at stake is really low? Oh, okay. So you can imagine, like, suppose a situation where you have. Um, so let's think of like embarrassing situations, mm. you know, so, so what, what tends to happen, so the kind of behavioral reaction to an embarrassing situation is you kind of want to like look away, you know what I mean? You want to yeah. distance yourself yeah. from this because, because what happens is that embarrassment occurs from, from a social faux pas, right? So you've done something, someone or you have done something that's socially inappropriate. And, and when you've done something socially inappropriate, usually it creates some negative emotions or at the very least some confusion in the, in the audience and the people who are observing. It. And so, so what happens is maybe you're going to use, you know, you, you have a George Costanza kind of moment, right, where he does something awkward in a social situation. You can imagine something really, really awkward, right, you know, the shrinkage joke, the famous <laughs> shrinkage joke. <laughs> from Seinfeld or something that's much more, much more mild in that way. Well, both of those situations may be very, very funny, but the embarrassment associated with the big violation, the shrinkage joke, can lead people again to like, and you don't want, you know, you don't want that with a brand. You want people leaning in. Yeah. Um, so here's an example of, here's another example. Here's a real example of this. And we actually used it in our paper. Um, there's this famous award-winning um, print ad for for like Pepsi Lime. It, it, it was a it was an ad I think in South America, mm. and it has uh, it basically has a can of Pepsi, and standing over the can is this anthropomorphized lime, so a lime with with arms and legs, and the lime is urinating into a glass of Pepsi. Mm. It's a funny <laughs> ad. People laugh at it. It won awards. It's it's very creative, but that's disgust based, you know, comedy. Yeah. And again, yeah. disgust is a negative emotion that leads people to 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 want to distance themselves to, mm -hmm. to get away. Well, you don't really want disgusting things associated with your food and beverage product, mm -hmm. for instance. Yeah. And so. So that's a big violation. It's a disgust-based violation. And in that way, it, it, it on one hand wins because it gets laughs and it gets attention. On the other hand, it doesn't create the right set of associations yeah. with, with your brand. I, no, I, and I definitely get that. And I'm wondering if your research, um, and this is, gets more nuanced, and, I, and, I, and this is hard to do, but I wonder if, if, if um, there's a gender component as well to some of this. I mean, I have a pretty deep sense of humor, so it takes a lot to offend me. But it, I also know for a lot of women, there are certain things that kind of split along gender lines. It's like women might be more the ew, disgust factor, and, and I know I'm generalizing a little bit, but mm -hmm. I wonder if there's gender uh, research that you have as well. Yeah. Well, yeah, so I think that, like, so um, I think gender is a predictor of, for instance, like it may, you know, disgust sensitivity yeah. I, I likely has a, has a, is predicted by gender. Mm -hmm. I I actually I'm a, I'm weird about this stuff. I actually worry less about that um, than most people. And the reason is there's a there's a researcher Rod Martin mm. who's at the University of Western Ontario, and he he really like he's written the book on on psychological theories of humor. And, um, and he, he recently published a chapter about gender differences in humor production and humor right. consumption. So people's ability to be funny and then their, the ease and likelihood in which they, they appreciate mm. comedy. And what he finds in his review of the literature is time and time again, men and women are more alike than they are different on those two dimensions. Yeah. The places you find the differences are in the professional comedy ranks, um, which which I don't believe has to do with any sort of innate ability. It just has to do with, as you know, is that as a woman, it's it's just 
a harder, it's just a harder road mm -hmm. in the sense that you have fewer mentors, you have male comedy club owners. Um, you know, it, it, it's a, um, it's a, a field, a profession that doesn't lend itself to having a family, for instance, you know, and so you're out late at night, you're out on the road and so on. And so it's just less woman friendly in general. And so, so what, but what people do is they see more professional male comedians and professional female comedians, and then they think that men are funnier than women. But that would be like saying, well, men are better lawyers than women. Right. Just because there are more male lawyers, and I don't believe that, you know, in, in any way. Um, so that's one difference. The second difference is in those mating and dating situations, is that there is a tendency for men to sort of show off a bit more, to try to be funny, and women to sit back and assess. <laughs> and the and the evolutionary psychologists yeah. of the world say, believe that, that this is being done because, um, because to be funny, it helps to be smart. And so it's a way to signal intelligence. And what's happening in those situations is that, that women are looking for cues like this more often. But outside of those situations, it's, it's surprising how much women like dirty jokes and will oh, tell yeah. dirty jokes and do all yeah. these kinds of things. Yeah. There's a little bit of a like, um, social desirability stuff where i think that 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 you see women's ability or their appreciation show up a little bit more in private than in public but in general it's the case that uh, so in that way like ah, i think like if you do your if you do your research well um you know you you, you shouldn't be too you know too worried in general yeah I, I would just I would just agree viscerally because that just strikes me as right. But yeah. you know, certainly can't uh, you know, don't have the the research on that. Although I will attest to when I was dating before I got married, um, a guy that I was dating found out that I loved Monty Python and decided to quote um, Life of Brian verbatim over dinner. And I remember thinking, okay, I get it. How do I get out of this? Yeah. <laughs> and I thought yeah, I'm witnessing. A, a mating ritual of some type. I just don't know how to describe what I'm seeing here. <laughs> right, yeah. Unfortunately, those were not his, his own jokes. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Um, Peter, this is awesome stuff. Um, what do you got coming up that you want to share with our, our listeners? Any new book or any anything coming up that they'd be interested in? Um, you know, it's, it's interesting. I'm in a little bit of a quiet time right now. Uh, so, you know, the, the, all the hoopla around the humor code is, uh, has quieted down. I am working on a, a comedy game show that I've done live a few times. Um, and so I'll, it's called Funny or True. And it, it pits comedians against scientists to see who has the best blend of brains and funny bone. Mm. And so I would say this, if any of your uh, listeners have a great venue and want, uh, I'm looking for places to do it as a live event. Um, so we've done it a number of times now, and it, and it it kills. People love it. It's a lot of fun, and so I've been working on that as a as a way to try to kind of put some of these ideas into action. I love it. So if anybody out there has a venue, that's great because I want to see this in action. I think that'd be hilarious. It's a pretty fun show. Yeah. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, how how can people reach you, Peter? Where can they find out more about you? What URL or or? Uh, yeah. So um, go to petermcgraw.org. If you if you go to petermcgraw.com, you'll find a Tulsa real estate agent. So uh, so petermcgraw.org, and I'm on the Twitter at, at @petermcgraw. <laughs> Those are the best places. No, oh, and humorcode.com, and uh, you can get the book incredibly cheap on Amazon these days. It's a great book, everybody, and I'm looking forward to seeing any follow up research because I think it's a fascinating, fascinating topic for me. But as both a nerd but also a practitioner, so I'm, I'm excited. And I'm happy to hear that Peter is in fact on the Twitter, and my grandma will be very happy. <laughs> Peter, as always, thanks so much. Kathy, it's my pleasure. Take care. Bye-bye.